Welcome to the Butterfly Effect. I'm Chris Horner and this is Milan Sam Remo. One of the greatest one day races in the world. In my book, there's six. Five monuments, this is the first. We're talking Milan Sam Remo, Tour of Flanders, Perry roubaix liege Beston liege and of course the race of the falling leaves in October in Italy also, Tour of Lombardia. Both, all are fantastic races. But today's course is one that just because it's the beginning of the season, it's got a lot of energy. The Italian people just absolutely love and eat it up. Every sprinter wants this win on their resume. It is a beautiful win, but you have to get over two hard climbs and you have to get over a 300 kilometer race. The first climb that you press is hard, okay? It's very hard. It's about 5.5 kilometers in length and about 4% not incredibly difficult as a climb all on its own but remember it's coming at the end of 275 kilometers in the legs you got to go up that the descent of the chapressa is not so crazy but when you get to the poggio this is when things get really dangerous when you go over the top this descent is insane now, I lived in Nice, France, which isn't far away, and I've trained over here back in the 90s when I was riding with Francis de Jure. Lars Mikkelsen and myself, he's a teammate of mine. Now he's one of the directors over in Europe. We rode over there, and we rode it in training and checked it out. When I did it in the race in the 90s, I thought, 300K, this is going to take forever. This is gonna be, we're going to be out here all day. But the time passes really fast. They're just going so smooth and so fast through the flatlands before they get to the coast that, believe it or not, that distance travels really quick and before you know it, you're on the coast. With 50K to go is when the action really gets exciting at Milan San Rio. And I wanna say that for 30K until we actually get on the climbs, one of the most dangerous courses that I'd been on just because of the road would be so wide and open and no traffic furniture of any kind, really along the coast but then you would enter these towns and the streets would just narrow up i mean you would get down to like one lane cars couldn't even pass each other it gets so narrow so we're going from four or five lanes on the coast popping into the town first it's cars parked on the side of the road then super narrow when you're going between buildings roundabouts all over the place there was construction throughout today's race, and the year I did it, there was construction all the time too. If you're riding your bike in Italy, you are always gonna be around construction because they always got something they gotta fix and repair. When I did it, it was a spectacular day. I had a fun time with it. In the 90s, I clearly wasn't racing for the win there. I was racing for our leader, Max Giandre, so I helped him out, and I remember at times when he would tell me to drop back to the car and get stuff for him, Trying to get back to the front was insane. It was so easy to go from the back of the group to the car, grab what you needed from the car, and jet back to the back of the group. But then, because of all the traffic furniture and parked cars and how hard everyone was racing, and you have 100 plus miles, 125 miles, 150 miles in the legs, every time Max was ask, asking me for something to go back to the car and get, when I'm coming back up with a Coke or a Snickers or some water or gels or something for him, the fight getting around the side of the field was just massive and incredibly dangerous. So you always had to have both hands on the brakes. I want to point something out I saw on today's stage too. The Astana rider, Fellini, they're going through the feed zone and you see him reaching down and he's pulling his shoe cover off his feet. Also, as they're going through the feed zone, it's slightly uphill. So I wanna bring this up mainly for the pro riders or the amateur riders there in bike races. When you're going through the feed zone, it is not the time to stop pedaling, okay? Especially when you're going slightly uphill. If you need to take arm warmers off, some gloves off, that's not so big of a deal. I really don't like taking my hands off the bars when I'm going through the feed zone because I think it's one of the most dangerous places in the race. But when you actually got to take a leg warmer off or a shoe cover like we're watching Fellini do in this photo, that is very dangerous because he's losing speed and dropping back. With all the feeders on the right side of the road, they're all coming out in the road, which is 
pushing the group together and now he's taking his shoe cover off so he's dropping back fast through the group and now everyone has to fan around him and be careful of all of the staff that's feeding the riders on the side of the road too is mass chaos i noticed that very dangerous time to be reaching down with only one hand on the bar you're not not going to be paying attention to what's happening in front of you so for you young pros out there that is not the time to start taking clothes off when you're going through the feed zone have that done way in advance and at a race like Milan Sam Rail, there is tons of time to take clothes off and go back to the car. It's not difficult until after you get down really on the coast road with about 50K to go. That's when the chaos starts. Now, let's get to the very first climb here because the Chipressa was just absolutely amazing job from the Ineos team. They had a full stack there. Luke Rowe was doing an amazing job. He pulls the last part of the Chabresa and you'll see when they reach the top because the road narrows up right there between the buildings. You have a hard left turn and they start to descend. Luke Rowe does 1-2K up that climb with the whole team on, on his wheel, does the descent and pulls along the flat road. He single-handedly did more than 10 kilometers on the front at the end of Melanson Rail. Guys, this is, this is a just a massive effort from a great rider. And we all know he's a spectacular domestique, but today he really performed well for his team. You see him on the front the whole time, and then it's Ghana that comes up and, and relieves him and really starts the Pojo on the front for Ineos. So they controlled going into the first climb there, the Chipressa, over the top for sure, down the descent, through the flats, and they started the Pojo on the front. And they're, now they're all riding for Tom Pedcock. He is riding on fantastic form, but he does maybe one of the few riders in this group that I think is doing some mistakes here when you really dissect the race closely. Fabulous legs, great form, young kids. So they're not really mistakes, just tiny little errors that maybe could have done something better if he'd raced a little bit different. Now, when Julian Alaphilippe attacks with about 2K before the top of the climb, he blows the race up there, and this is when we see Caleb Ewan is riding amazing. I mean, he's covering the move to Julian Alaphilippe, Walt Van Aert, and of course the amazing Matthew Van Der Poel. I mean, this is, these are three of the biggest names we've been talking about already all season, and we talked about them all last year. We all know that these were the three riders to watch, and it's Caleb Ewan up there who's Bridging across to the gap, and then when we get to the top of the climb there, he decides to just go ahead and go to the front and make his presence known. This was one other little small mistake. I think when you're a sprinter like Caleb Ewan, you'd have been better just sitting fifth, sixth wheel back there and staying quiet and a little bit hidden the whole time. He has fantastic legs. When you get these kind of legs, sometimes you want to show off a little bit because you're so used to swinging back there every day on other stages th throughout the season that when you have these kind of fantastic form like Caleb has, you really want to show everybody that they're finally not hurting you. You want to just kind of, you know, you've got some testosterone, you want to pound the, the chest a little bit. I think Caleb should have just stayed in the back, fifth, sixth wheel. Of course, he has to go with the favorites. You stay with them, you go over the top. But you see when he starts to descend, he's starting second, third wheel there. And this is on the descent is where Tom Pedcock makes another mistake. He starts pulling with about 4.3K before the line, and he's pulling down the descent. Now, in my mind, I believe what he's doing is he's a very good bike handler. He wants to go through the corners as fast as he can and see if he can open up a gap and go solo to the line because he's not a pure sprinter like the guys on his wheel. Everybody on his wheel, with the exception of Soren Kral Anderson, as fast, fast guys, okay? You cannot drop this kind of talent through the corners. I mean, it's just, can't, will someone drop? For sure, but are you gonna drop five of the best sprinters, the best bike handling guys in the professional sport? You're not. So when Tom is on the front there pulling, he's really just wasting energy. What he needed to do is stay back, stay hidden, let Walt Van Aert, Matthew Vanderpool work their magic and be aggressive. You know Julian Alaphilippe's going to try it. So let one of those three favorites do all the work down the descent. 
Instead, Tom rides the front and he rides it all the way to about 3K to go, which is the bottom of the climb. You'll see he stands up, he looks back. When he looks back, it flares. When that flares up, that's allowing that second group to catch on. And of course, Jasper Stuvitz. Now, this was a beautiful move, and this is the only trick you have left in your bag, okay? If you're not Walt Van Aert, if you're not Caleb Ewan, if you're not Peter Sagan back there, these guys are all guys who are going to win the sprint for certain. They are fast, they are strong, they are beautiful riders for a course like this. Now, Jasper Stuvens does an amazing move, tacks up the left side, and it's Tom Pitcock again who tries to close it, then stops halfway, eases up. Now Jasper Stuvens is gone. Okay, Soren Krog Anderson, after a couple moves try to go that don't make it, Soren Krog Anderson jumps about a K later. This is a beautiful move because he goes clean. The only problem wrong with this move is that when he gets there to Jasper Stuvens, he's going to catch him at about 1K to go. So he doesn't have much time to recover the legs from that big effort of bridging the gap. Jasper Stuvens does the next 300 meters on the front. Wise guy that he is, pulls over. Soren Craig Anderson is going to pull from about 700 to under 200 meters to go and leaves really Jasper Stuvens with that little bit of rest right there. Now punch it all the way to the line and get an amazing win for this guy. Now, if you guys aren't familiar with Jasper Stuvens, then you haven't watched the butterfly effect because Perry Nice, I talked about him many times. He was leading out ex-world champion Mads Pedersen, his teammate, on the early stages of Perry Nice. And I had pointed out many times that just Jasper Stuvens alone had beat every team in that race when it came to the lead out. De Kunit Quickstep, Francis De Jure, he had destroyed those teams. Even the Bora Hansgrohe team, he had destroyed those on stage one or two of Perry Nice and had done an amazing lead out and hand delivered a stage win to Mads Pedersen, who just didn't have the legs to finish it off after an amazing job from Jasper Stuvens there. So today he gets Milan San Real, greatest one day win on his, on his resume to date. It's a beautiful win, well deserved, and he did it perfect. I love watching perfect racing. Behind Caleb Ewan, again, he's always sitting second or third wheel there, but he's not coming through and doing a pull. So when they had a couple brief moments to maybe pull these two guys back, it was Caleb Ewan back there really causing that group to slow down again. So Walt Van Aert does a huge pull under the 1K sign to try to finally close the gap. And you'll see him coming out of the corner there with about 800 meters. And it's Caleb Ewan sitting second wheel, but he's not going to come through. Walt Van Aert certainly isn't going to pull 1K all the way to the line. So by having Caleb right there in that position, he's really too close. He needed to be fifth or sixth and hope that somebody jumps and attacks and then he follows that and then goes to the line with his own sprint. Small problems. Caleb Ewan, amazing legs today. Still finishes second on the stage. Walt Van Aert pulls out a great ride. And let's not lead, off, lead out Peter Sagan because, guys, he has a great ride today. He's coming back from COVID-19 where he was in lockdown. He had Trino Adriatico for training, and now he's come here and he's getting a solid result. So what do we got to look forward to at the next big monument races when we get up to the classics and the one-day specialists up there? Hopefully now we're going to see the three big guys with Walt Van Aert, uh, Julian Alaphilippe, and of course, Matthew Van Der Poel, and now we're going to see Peter Sagan in the mix if we're really lucky. Four guys all going to the line. Now, in years past, keep in mind when you're watching these classics, everybody, everybody was afraid to work with Peter Sagan. Now, you got three big names. Are these three big young kids, are they going to be willing to work with Peter Sagan in the future? That's what we got to look forward to in the classics to come. Hope you guys enjoyed the Butterfly Effect today. I'm Milan Samrio, and I'll see you real soon.